Good morning, Freedom of Foxes, and welcome to another round of Wake Up With Coach. This is day 16. Can you believe it? We're on 16. I'm just sitting down here in my den right now, just having a relaxing moment. It's a little cold outside this morning, so we're going to just stay inside and we're going to do a little bit of talking. I, for once in a while, I think that's a good idea that we just sit down and talk. And I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, some of the fun things I've been able to learn. A few years ago, my wife was sitting in the kitchen and had an amazing experience with her, one of our daughters. And bless my wonderful wife's heart, she shared this story with me and it just floored me as I started to think about it. My daughter came into the kitchen while my wife was working there. She was doing potatoes or something in the kitchen. She was probably four or five years old, a little bit younger than you guys. But she came into the kitchen and she turned to my wife and said something that just stopped my wife and what she was thinking. She turned to my wife and said, Mom, I'm a good looker, aren't I? And my wife was like, oh my goodness, what, who, who said all this? Oh my goodness, do I have to have a, a talk? Do I have to do all these other crazy things about life? What's going on? But my wife handled it like a champ. And she knelt down next to my daughter and said, Yes, you are. You are a good looker. And my daughter, without missing a beat, turns to her and says, I knew it. I'm a good finder, too. <laughs> now, where that came from, I don't know. But the innocence of that wonderful learning lesson was fantastic. For me especially. Do you realize that so much of what we establish as a, uh, a mentality, uh, the way we think about ourselves, our characteristic foundation, those types of things, all happen while we're young. And as we build them and add to them over long periods of time, certain things become kind of part of our normal thinking. They call it subconscious, if you remember. We talked a little bit about this last week. But our subconscious thinking is how um, we do things without even having to think about it. And we talked last week about fear and how fear uh, can just be such a bad thing for us and how it stops people from doing some of the great things that they do in life. However, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how you can counteract these fears, okay? Now, if I was to tell you or ask you what the opposite of fear would be, that would be a hard answer, fear. Now, remember, we talked about fear being fear of failure, meaning I'm not good enough, and fear of loss, meaning life isn't going the way it's supposed to go. And all the other fears are all wrapped up, phobias are wrapped up into those two things. Those are the underlying core ones. Now, if you think about it, all, remember if I said, all negative emotions, sadness, frustration, all those types of things, anger, those all stem from a state of fear. So, the best ways to overcome that sense of fear is wrapped in two words because it's a choice, a choice that you make all the time in everything that you do, all the time. I mean, it's a mindset. And the things that you, these two things that, that help combat those fear, fear of failure, fear of loss, is trust and love. Those are the things that fight this fear. And both of those go hand in hand. And they're both a choice. Now let me tell you about a classroom. I know right now we're not in a classroom, we're at home doing our classes, but the idea is still there. And that's what the cool part about it is that with this idea of understanding this fear, okay? It's really cool. I mean, as you're in a classroom and you're sitting down to take a test, how does that make you feel? A test, you know, I mean, I when I took tests, and I, I, I have struggles, I am a little dyslexic, but when I took a test, I hated them. I would get like all nervous and scared, like, oh my God, I'm not gonna do a good job. And I mean, even if I had studied good and hard for it, I still didn't think it was a very good thing for me. So I always did poorly on tests. So when I got to that, I was, now the worst testing place I've ever been to is at a college. And this college place, when you walked into this testing, they called it a testing center because they didn't take the test in class. This testing center was like really, they had like, bulletproof glass on the windows as you came in and you had to come in and you gave them all your books and you gave them your wallet and you gave them everything that you needed and they handed you a piece of paper and uh, sometimes it was a math test it would be a calculator and a pencil 
and that was it. And you walked into the room, and the room was just this quiet, I mean, there's a clock on the wall, you hear it ticking, tick, 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 and with just a bunch of desks. And there was probably three or four other people in there just taking tests. And it was mute silence, like a library. And you sit down and you take your test and go, oh my goodness, I gotta do great. And as you're done with the test, you'd hand them the paper and they'd scan it for you and they'd say, here's your grade. And you would find out immediately if you passed or failed or, or if you, you did good things, you know, all that type of stuff. And you'd walk away going, oh my goodness, this is so hard. Why did they do it? I'm such a fail. If you did bad, you'd be like, I'm a failure. If you did good, you'd be like, yeah, it's over. This is fantastic. See, life's a lot like that. Sometimes we get in that mind frame that life is a, a test of where we've got to prove our value or our worth. So it's like that testing center. Everything's so frantic and, and, and fearful. But the truth of it is, it's kind of like a classroom, not a testing center. Let me describe to you what the, the ideal classroom would be. The ideal classroom would be, teacher comes in, hands out tests. Bobby's on the front of the row. Bobby gets his paper, everybody sits down, teacher says, here you go, take it. If you have any questions, come on up to the desk, you can ask me. I'll work with you one-on-one. -on -one. We already studied in the class, we've given you all the, the, the things that you need to study. So take the test and then come on up afterwards. Now what if you were a young guy in the front row and maybe you didn't do so well on the test and you did pretty poorly. And you took the test of the teacher and she graded it and says, oh, you struggled a little with this, I saw. Hey, let's work on it together. Okay, we'll work on this problem and this problem. Now you go back and try it again. And he goes back and tries it again. See, the beautiful thing about this life is it's not about pass or fail. It's about what did you learn? What did you get? And did it make you improve or help you improve? And some lessons are harder than others. See, and that's the idea of this fear and trust and love thing. See, this fear is very, very direct. Fear of failure. I'm not good enough. This is bad. Oh my goodness. This is a fear of loss. Like, oh my goodness, life isn't going the way I want it to go. Or you have trust and love. And trust is, number one, you know what? I'm still going to be a marvelous, wonderful person even if I don't do so well on some experience of life. So, fear of failure. I'm not good enough. Yeah, I am. I'm a great person and I can still learn and grow. So, two, life isn't going the way I want it to go. It's all uh, Two, trust that, you know what? In this life, I'm supposed to learn things. I'm supposed to grow. I'm supposed to be able to make mistakes. There's a difference between your fear and your trust. Love is a byproduct of that trust. Because you now understand that my value is not gonna change just because I make a mistake, then you can turn around to your friend and your neighbor and say, you know what, that's tough, I understand. Let me help you, just like that teacher did for you. Now that concept was hard for me to understand. Matter of fact, I didn't understand that until I became a lot older. And it actually happened <laughs> the first time I could really think about uh, when the, the contrast between fear and trust and love was so powerful to me. It actually happened again while I was in the military. It was right before I actually went in and became a, a military member at a place called boot camp. Now boot camp is a magnificently built place. I mean, its entire existence is to try to get you to quit being in the military. So, I mean, they would do anything they possibly can to mentally, physically, emotionally, uh, intellectually, think, I mean, any way they possibly can to get you to quit, they would try to do it. And I did not understand this. I have nobody in my family who's ever been in the military or my wife's family who's ever been in the military. So when they sent me off to boot camp, I had only had about three months of ROTC in college. And during those three months, they taught me how to really make a bed and to uh, make my clothes look really good. That was about it. Maybe March a little bit. So they flew us out to Florida. Actually, it was just me from my school. And uh, I got off the airplane, and right there, they were all, they had a couple of guys in the military uniform, and they gathered up all these people, and they put us on a bus, and they drove us out in the middle of nowhere, Florida. I mean, we went across bridges, out in the lakes, around, around water, and all this type of stuff. 
And, and nobody talked on the entire trip. It was like mute silence. Like It was like sitting there like, oh my goodness, where are we going? This is so scary. And, and you know, I have seen the old war movies. And, you know, I had seen how scary those, those boot camp experiences are. It's really funny, though, by the way, if you ask somebody who's in the military, most of them don't want to remember boot camp. <laughs> they don't tell you great stories about boot camp. Um, so as we came in around the, 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 the bus drop-off, um, a guy came and stood right in front of the exit from the bus. And he was wearing a very unique hat. It was a really flat-brimmed hat. As I said, I seen the war movies. I knew who this guy was. This guy they called drill sergeants. And they are not nice people. So I got out, I, I got climbing off, grabbed my stuff, started climbing off the bus, and as each person came down off this bus, he stuck out his hand and he says, Welcome to boot camp. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. And I got, oh my goodness, this is so nice. I can do boot camp. This is great. And he says, grab your stuff and go right over there and stand in line. And I did. I picked up my bags. And I went right over there. In the, and I go, this line had about 50 people in it. And they were all winding itself around the side of this building. Um, and and as, as people would start to go into the room one by one, more people would show up and get off buses, that type of stuff. And we started to have fun. We started talking about where we were from and, and what we did and, you know, and all that type of stuff. And, hey, this is so great. You know, this boot camp type thing. And as I got close to the front, and I just came around the wall on the wall, uh, around the, the side of the wall. On the wall is a sign that says, once you pass this sign, you're at boot camp. And I said, that's kind of unique. That's kind of weird. And as I stepped across where that sign was, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that drill sergeant appeared right next to me. And he took what, I mean, he didn't even wait. He just started screaming at me. And he's just yelling. I was like, holy cow, what's going on? Now, I've had people yell at me before. I mean, I've been on football teams where coaches have yelled at me. My parents, mom and dad. I mean, you know what it means when somebody's yelling at you. Remember when mom uses your middle name? <laughs> when mom uses your middle name, you know you're in big trouble. Or when they use your entire name, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> so I've had people yell at me. This guy, however, was totally different than anybody I've ever had talked to me before. As he yelled at me, it was unbelievable. It was fantastic. And as I was standing there and he starts chewing me out, I'm thinking, what did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. I, didn't, I was just standing here like everybody else. I mean, there were, there were all the people in front of me he didn't talk to. All the people behind me he didn't talk to. But he yelled at me. I did the only thing I could think of, which was stand at attention. And he just kept yelling. I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Well, fast forward a little bit to the very end of my boot camp because there was an experience in the middle of my boot camp that changed everything for me. But it made perfectly logical sense when I asked the drill sergeant because by the end of boot camp, we uh, kind of got to be good friends. And by the end of boot camp, I went to him and I said, Sarge, do you remember that first day? And he's like, yes, you should have seen your face. You were funny looking. <laughs> I was like, Sarge, why did you pick me out of the lineup? I mean, there were so many other people around. Why did you pick me? And I will never forget what he said to me. He said, if I can find the biggest, strongest, dumbest looking person, and I can get them to stand at attention, what do you think it does for everybody else? I know, I sat there and went, oh my goodness, if I could get that person to do what I want them to do, what do you think everybody else around them is going to do? They're going to do it too. And I only have to fix one person. Well, that outlined my entire boot camp experience. Because guess who was the biggest, strongest, dumbest looking person everywhere he went? It was me! That's right, I was always the biggest. And <laughs> I always wondered why people would always stop and yell at me and pick on me and chew me out and, and uh, talk about everything. I mean, this, these people knew everything about you. I mean, they would give you some of the most lame activities. To I had been out probably about three, maybe four weeks into a, about a nine week long experience. And I had had enough. I was, I, was, I was so scared and tired that at nighttime I would literally cry myself to sleep because I hated it. I hated being there. And I cried myself to sleep. And, and this one night I can remember, I would just had had enough. I was ready to just go walk out of there and say, I quit, this is terrible. And I remember as I, I climbed into bed, in the, but as I sat in that bed and, and I kind of curled up so my legs wouldn't rip the bottom of the bed out, I fell asleep. 
and I don't remember anything. I mean, it would happen that fast. But as I I, I just fall asleep, all of a sudden I hear this bell, ding, 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 loud as could be. It's like, holy cow, what's going on? And I remember opening my eyes, it was still dark outside, and the sergeants walked around going, get your gear on, get your clothes on, blah, 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 get on the hall as fast as you can. I'm like, okay, okay. And we went out to the hall, I got dressed, and I went out in the hall, and, I, and out in the hall are these backpacks, and these backpacks were like, like this tall, like, like five, three feet off the ground, right? And, and he's like, grab a bag and get in the back of the truck. And I said, okay. And I reached out and grabbed the bag. And as I lifted up the bag, I realized the bag was full of rocks. There was nothing but rocks. I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. And I put this thing on my back and I ran right out to this truck, this big old, this old, uh, it's called a, a deuce and a half. And I climbed in the back with some of the other guys from my platoon. And we drove out off the base, out in the middle of nowhere. And as we, as we got there, he pulled over and, and we jumped out of the back and he handed us a map and a compass and said, this is how you get back. If you don't make it back by breakfast, you don't eat. That's a bad thing, by the way, to tell football players like me. <laughs> Food is very important. So we started back, heading back towards this camp. And we knew what time breakfast ended, so we were watching our clock. Now, they didn't just let us wander off. It was actually this really long obstacle course. And military obstacle courses are just like you see in the movies. You gotta climb across the ropes, you cross the water. I mean, I, I had people when we were crossing the water, it was up to like right here on me. And people, I had people in my group that were just that tall. So I would like walk behind him and I had to like help lift him out of the water to keep him from drowning. But we had, we had the giant wall. It was like 16 feet up and we had the rope bridges we had to crawl across. And we had the mud that we had to crawl in and the barbed wire over our head and they were shooting things. I had never experienced anything like it. And by the time I was done, I was covered from head to toe in bleh and garbage. It was nasty. And I had this 100 pound backpack on just full of rocks. And I'm like, oh, this life is terrible. But we got there with 10 minutes left for breakfast. And I was standing in that line, I was like, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. I'm going to get here for breakfast, it's awesome. And breakfast is really unique in, at boot camp too. You stand in this long line, um, and sometimes it would wind outside the door because there are so many people. And then it was a cafeteria, um, kind of like the size of our gym, uh, but there were tables. And these tables only sat with four people, okay, L little square tables. And right in the middle of the room was a round table where all the drill sergeants sat. We used to call it the snake pit. Now, as we would walk in, um, we were standing in line. They, they would literally, because you couldn't allow, you weren't allowed to talk at all. They gave you this little white book that had all sorts of Air Force information on it. And you stand against the wall with your shoulder right against the wall. You guys probably don't recognize that, right? Single, silent, and straight. Just like that, with our shoulder against the wall. We'd hold this little book like this close to our face. And we were supposed to wait and study while we wait for our time to go get breakfast. So I was sitting there with my book, and I was thinking to myself, I hate, I was covered from mud and bleh and garbage and bleh, head to toe, I still had my backpack on, and I was like, I hate this place, this place is terrible, I don't, why am I even here, I don't even know why, and I'm thinking to myself, oh man, this is awful, and then all of a sudden, another drill sergeant comes over and stands next to me, and she looks at me, she probably only came up to right about here on me, right, and this little tiny girl turns to me and says, Cadet Young! And I turned to face her like I'm supposed to, and I said, pulled the book down. I said, yes, ma'am. She says, what's on page 43? And I said, ma'am, I do not know, because that's one of the five answers you're allowed to give them. She says, on your face. And let me tell you what on your face is. You guys ever wonder why I love push-ups so much? That's because I learned how amazing they can be at boot camp. We did them all the time. And they, I mean, I got down on my face right there in the middle of the entire cafeteria. There were people sitting out in the seats just packed and they weren't allowed to talk. The line was still long. I'm sitting there, I got a hundred pound backpack on, I'm covered in blah blah blah. And she she makes me do push-ups and she doesn't tell me to stop. Now one way you can get in a lot of trouble is if you were asked to do something and then you stop before you're told to stop. You can get in a lot of trouble. So I started doing push-ups. And I'm sitting there going, I hate this place. That wasn't the hardest part. And I remember doing push-ups till my arms kind of creaked. I just wanted to curl up. And they were so hard that time and stuff. But the hardest part actually was, while I was still doing push-ups, all the people that I had just gone through that obstacle course with that were all covered just like me, they would step over me to keep the line moving. 
And by the time she said, okay, stand up, I was in the middle of a totally different group. I had no clue who anybody was. And I smelled terrible, I looked terrible. And I literally just said, I'm done. This is the worst thing ever, I, I, I quit. And she says, report to me right after. I said, yes, ma'am, I knew that wasn't gonna be bad, a good thing. So I, I finally got up the front of the line, they gave me my food, they slopped it all on the tray, because you don't get to pick. They just put it all on there, and they give you glasses and everything, they just, I mean, they give you it all. I had to go sit down with three people I've never met before. But you're not allowed to talk. You're only allowed to eat. And you only get like seven minutes to eat. And as I sat down right there at the table, I started eating as fast as I could. To make things really hard on you, I told you they try to figure out ways to really mess with you. They say, you have to figure out between the four of you, who gets the glasses, who gets the plates, who gets the silverware, and who gets the trash. And you can't do it by talking. But you got to figure it out. And then to make things even worse... They say the person who gets the glasses has to take the tray with all the glasses of those four people to the snake pit and present it to the person there to show that everybody has drunk their juice because they're really scared about people being dehydrated. That means you don't have enough water. So I was sitting in this group and guess what? That's right. I got stuck with the glasses. Can you believe that? I got all the glasses like, oh, great, darn it. I ain't getting the glasses, getting so much trouble. But I was like, um, I got to go up there. Oh, and the other rule they just instituted was the person who has the glasses, who presents them to the person at the snake pit, has to make a design out of the glasses or they get in trouble. I was like, oh, great. I got to present the glasses and I got to make a design. Well, I couldn't think of anything to make. So I said, you know what? I'm going to make a musical note. So I did. I made the, made the glasses look like a musical note. And I picked up the train. I walked over to the snake pit. And sitting right there in the snake pit is guess who? That little tiny drill sergeant lady. And as she, I'm sitting there. She looks at me. She's like, oh. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not going to be fun. And I walked right up there. I'm standing at attention. And I, and, I, and I present my glasses. I'm like, ma'am, I'm here to present my glasses. And she says, all right, what did you make? And I said, ma'am, I made a note. And she says, oh, you're a musician then. And I said, no, ma'am, I sing. <laughs> and she turns to me and she says, oh, sing for me. Immediately my mind goes, what? I'm in a cafeteria. You want me to break out singing right now? I, I, I couldn't think of anything to sing. So I turned around and says, ma'am, what would you like to sing? Remember, I'm not looking at her. I'm looking straight out because I'm standing at attention. I'm looking out the windows going, oh my God, I got to sing now? Are you kidding me? In the cafeteria, there's 400 kids right here. All just, just, there's nobody talking. I mean, it's just almost quiet except for the utensils eating. I'm like, ma'am, what would you like to hear? And she says, I don't know. You figure it out. And I sat there, my head going, what am I going to sing? And I just sat there. And I remember that feeling that I had of just, I quit, I'm done. And, and you know what? Something snapped in me. About like that fast. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to sing. And I'm going to do it loud. I'm going to do it annoying because I don't care what anybody else thinks anymore. I'm just going to do it. So I started to sing, and I did it as loud as I possibly could. You know what? I could not figure out what, what I was going to sing until it just, I opened my mouth, and it just came out. I mean, it was amazing. It just, just popped right out. You know what I sang? You're probably thinking that, oh, it probably sing ABCs or something like that. He couldn't remember. No. You know what came out of my mouth? A song called Amazing Grace. I never sung Amazing Grace before. I did not know any of the verses. I didn't know the words. I'd heard it once or twice, but it was not something I could remember. But I started singing it, and I sang it as loud as I could. I remember staring out the window, and I was like, you're not going to beat me. You're not going to beat me. I'm going to do this. And the craziest thing happened. I got through the first verse of this song. And remember, you get in trouble if you stop. And I, I finished the first verse. But she didn't stop me. So I started in singing it again. I think it was probably the first verse all over. Maybe it was the second verse. I don't know. But I started singing it again. And the crazy thing is I got through like two lines of the, of the song. And all of a sudden, a voice from somewhere in there. Remember, I'm still staring out the window straight ahead. Somewhere in that room, another voice joins in. 
And somewhere on the far side, two words later, another voice joins in. By the time I finish that second verse, there was probably five of us. But she doesn't stop us. So I go on to the next verse, and I'm singing, again, it's probably the first verse. I'm singing still as loud as I possibly can. And the craziest thing happened. When I started on that third verse, I would have guessed, because I'm not allowed to look around, I would have guessed that every single person in that room was singing. It was so loud, and it was so emotionally packed, I snapped. I went from, holy cow, I realized two different things. One, my realization was, I'm not alone. Right here in this room is like 400, 500 other cadets all doing exactly the same experience that I was doing. And number two, I realized that I could help and not let them influence me at all. They had no power over me. Sure, they can maybe do push-ups. I can do push-ups. I was not scared of push-ups. My, me as a person was not based upon whether or not they liked me. My value as a human being doesn't change because I'm at boot camp. And so this relief of just built up anger and sadness and frustration kind of seeped out of me. If you remember some of those, those are fears. If you think about it, what was my fears? Why was I so, I was so wrapped up in myself that I couldn't think about other people. I couldn't think clearly about who I was and my strengths and abilities. Fear of failure. I'm not good enough to do this. Fear of loss. This is not what I planned boot camp to be. It is not what I wanted to do with my life. This is so bad. Everything was wrapped up in those two things. My value does not change. This is not a testing center. It's a classroom for me to learn in. It changed everything about my boot camp. Did the fact that I was the biggest, strongest, dumbest looking person change? No. It didn't change, but I did. Because from then on, I got in more trouble. Because I realized I could do push-ups for a long time. It didn't really matter. I could do what they needed me to do. It didn't matter. So they would come and pick on me. And when I'm standing straight, I'm trying to be straight. I, I'd start to laugh. I'd be like, <clears throat> and you're like, are you laughing? I say, no, sir. He says, on your face. I mean, it happened like five, six more times. I, because nothing they could say or do could change me. And I spent the rest of that boot camp trying to be a help to everybody else. It changed the entire group I was with. My flight, my group of people, we ended up winning two of the three major awards by the end of that camp. One spark, and it changed my experience. Everybody else had theirs, their spark, and it changed theirs. By the time we were done with boot camp, the sergeants, they didn't even pay attention to us anymore. We just skated right on through. And we were good. You're exactly the way you're supposed to be. This experience we're going through right now is exactly what we need to have happen to us. Trust it. Trust yourself. Find opportunities to serve others. Overcome the fear of woe is me, and I'm not good enough, and this life isn't going the way I want it to. All right, guys, thanks for sharing a few more minutes with me. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you again. See you later.